Well, today I'd like to speak to you, and you actually have the topic there in your uh, bulletin, but my topic is the Word of God and the will of God. And I've been thinking a lot about a very important question that I've applied to my own life, and that is, do I really, really appreciate the Bible? How many of you have a Bible with you this morning? Hold it up. Wow. Look, Pastor, that ought to thrill you. Do you realize the gift that you have in your hands? The Bible, the whole Bible, all 66 books that are included in this volume, in your own language. This happens to be in English. How many of you have one in Spanish, some other language? As I was thinking about that, my mind went back to 16th century England. There was a man who had a tremendous passion to get the Bible, the common people, get the common people a Bible in their own language, in that case, English. They did not have a Bible. Of course, the printing press had just been discovered not too far be, uh, ahead of that time. But they did not have a Bible in their own language. And so this, uh, this young man, who was a very brilliant man, he actually spoke seven languages fluently. In addition that, to the fact that he was a scholar in Hebrew, the old language of the Old Testament, and in Greek, the language of the New Testament. And this vision, this passion gripped him, and he began to translate the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, into English. Well, the leadership in England was not very happy with that. The king of England was really bent out of shape because he did not want the Bible in the hands of the common people so they could read it in English. The hierarchy of the church was angry. They did not want the Bible in the language of the common people. Do you know why? Because it would reveal their sin and their attitudes and their behaviors that were out of sync with what God reveals in His Word. And so the, the, uh, the persecution was so intense that William Tyndale had to leave England to go to another country to complete the translation of the Bible in English. Well, he completed the task, if you can imagine, the horrendous task of translating all of this into English. And he finally completed the project. And then one of his friends, so-called, said, William, you can come back to England. You'll be safe. Come on back. And he did. But it was a setup. Because when William Tyndale got back to England, he was strangled by the leadership in England, the authority of England, the religious leaders of England, the so-called religious leader of the king of England, and then he was burned at the stake. You know why? So we could have the Bible in English. I know about you, but that story moves me. You know, his final words as he was dying at the spring, burned at the stake, was, Lord, Lord, please open the eyes of the king of England. He died so we could have this gift. Well, the fact of the matter is, in the next four years, there were four translations of the Bible in English. 
One was the Great Bible, it's so-called. And about 70 to 80 percent of all of the content in that Bible was William Tyndale's translation into English. And finally, in 1611, King James, now in control as King of England, authorized what we know as the King James Version. And 75 percent of all of the King James Version was the work of William Tyndale, a man who gave his life so we could have the Bible in our language. And so I've been thinking a lot about a very important question in my own life. Do I really, really appreciate this marvelous gift that I can have it all and I can read it and I can study it? It's a gift to me and a gift to you from God, but through a man who literally died that we could have it in our language. And in many languages, because once it was translated into English, it is spread around the world into Spanish and Chinese and all of the other languages through Wycliffe Bible translators giving the Word of God to people. So that they can know the will of God. And that is the greatest gift that God has given us in the Bible is that through the Word of God we can know the will of God. You see, God wants us to know His will. And God began that incredible process of divine revelation which goes back to Mount Sinai when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, out of all that paganism, and literally, they heard God's voice from Mount Sinai. God spoke and said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And he went on to reiterate the Ten Commandments. And if you go back and look at the text, the people heard those words before they saw them in writing. And later, God inscribed, as it were, with His own finger, the Ten Commandments in those tablets of stone, God's first written revelation to humanity. Why? So we can know His will. Later, God continued to speak through the Old Testament prophets. He spoke through men like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and Daniel, the Word of God. He continued to speak through the, the minor prophets, men like Hosea and Joel and Amos and Obadiah and Jonah and Micah and Nahum, Habakkuk and Zeph Zechariah and Zephaniah and Malachi and all of the prophets that we have recorded in the Old Testament. Why? So that we can know the will of God, ultimately pointing to the great revelation that was coming to us in Jesus Christ. And then God spoke through the apostles in the New Testament era. But not only did He speak through all these centuries to the prophets, beginning with Moses all the way through, up through the apostles that have given us the New Testament, God inspired the authors of Scripture to record His messages in writing. And that's why we have in our hands today the Word of God. To what extent do you, do I, do we really appreciate this gift? I hope you think about that. Now for a moment, I'm going to take you back to the upper room. I want to take you to Jesus with the 11. Judas is no longer there. He's left. He's gone to betray Jesus. And the other apostles, the other 11 men were really nervous. Thomas was really bent out of shape. And there in John chapter 14, Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't worry because 
I'm going to go away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I will come back to receive you. And that's where Thomas said, Lord, Lord, we, we don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. And Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And then he began to instruct them on an incredible truth. And that truth is that God was going to send the spirit of truth once Jesus Christ went back to heaven. After that discussion in the upper room, they descended into the streets of Jerusalem. They went by the temple that evening. Jesus descended into the Kidron Valley. He's heading over to the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows what lies ahead of him. He prays, and ultimately he goes to the cross. He pays the price for our sins. He dies. He is buried. He is resurrected. He appeared for a period of time, and then there on that mountain outside of Jerusalem, when he was about to ascend, the apostles said, Lord, are you going to restore now the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Just simply go back to Jerusalem and wait. And they did. But before Jesus died, before he left that upper room, Here's what he said to these men. In John 14, 16, there they are, nervous, worried. And Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. That's a great word. In the Greek text, it's parakletos. I want you to say that with me for a reason. Parakletos. Say it. Parakletos. I'm going to send you another parakletos. Here it's translated counselor. Other places, the old King James, another comforter. Remember that? I'm going to send you, and I, I like the word encourager. I'm going to send you another encourager. I'm going to send you another teacher. And notice Jesus said, to be with you forever, he is the spirit of truth. Now that's a significant statement. This parakletos, this encourager, the Holy Spirit is identified as the spirit of truth. Jesus goes on to explain there in that upper room with these men. In John 14, 25 to 26, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the parakletos, say it, the parakletos, who is that? The Holy Spirit. The Father will send him in my name. He will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. Now remember, he is speaking now to 11 men. They're the apostles. They are there in the upper room. And the fact of the matter is, Jesus has been with them and teaching them now for almost three years or a little over three years. And much of what Jesus taught them during those three years, they didn't understand and a lot of it went in, went in one ear and out the other. They had no comprehension, really, of why he came. But Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come, he'll teach you all things. He will remind you of everything I have told you. And sitting there or reclining there with Jesus in the upper room was Matthew. He has no idea. That someday when the Paracletos, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will pick up his pen, his quill, and he will write, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn 
for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And he continues to write and to write, and it records what Jesus taught there on the Mount of Beatitudes, something he had totally forgotten. And even there, he was there listening. And he went on to record the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. See, Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will remind you of everything I have told you. A little later on in that conversation, John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, Jesus said, again calling Him the Spirit of truth. Three times in this passage, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. Again, talking to these 11 men, for he will not speak on his own. He will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. And there sits John right next to Jesus, John the apostle. And he doesn't have a clue what's going to happen. And after Jesus died and rose again, went back to heaven, the paracletos, the Holy Spirit came. One day he picked up his pen. And he began to record under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he went on to record the miracles that Jesus had done and what Jesus has said. And at the end of that book, he said, many other things I could write that Jesus did in our presence, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you might have life through his name. He wrote the whole Gospel of John. That's what Jesus was saying was going to happen when the paracletos came. At that moment, they had no clue. And John certainly did not understand that 60 years later, he's going to be on the island of Patmos, a fugitive, as it were, a man who's been banished. And Jesus himself comes and says, John, pick up your pen and record what is and what is to come. And he wrote the book of Revelation. And that was a fulfillment of what Jesus said here in John 13. See? Read it. He will also declare to you what is to come. And that didn't happen in John's life until 60 years after this statement was made in the upper room. And that is the final book in the Bible. That's his gift to us. Well, what happened was, as I said, Jesus left that upper room with these men. They went to the, down through the garden to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was taken, he was crucified, died, buried, rose again, eventually went back to heaven. And there they were, waiting in that upper room, as Jesus told them to. And all of a sudden, there was this mighty, rushing wind that filled the place where these men were worshiping, along with the 120. And everyone came running, and there were thousands that were in Jerusalem because they had been there for a very special reason. You see, God-fearing Grecian Jews came from all over the Roman world, from Africa, the Mesopotamia region, from the islands of the sea, from Rome. They came from all over. Why? To worship in the temple in Jerusalem. They were God-fearing Grecian Jews. They came for a 50-day celebration. And they were ready to leave, to go back to their homes. It was the last day, which is called the day of Pentecost. And on that day, the promise came through. The spirit of truth descended as Jesus said he would. And all these men, these 11 guys, all men of Galilee, it said, stood up and began to speak in all these different languages that are listed there in the beginning of the book of Acts, and people were hearing the word of God in their own language. And Peter got up to preach. And it began, he quoted the Old Testament. And he said, this is what Jesus had prophesied. It's happening. 
Peter's beginning to understand. And it says 3,000 put their faith in Jesus Christ as a result of that. Now, what happened? Well, we read in Acts 2.42, and they, that is these 3,000, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What was the apostles' teaching? It was what God promised would happen when the spirit of truth came. First, he began to speak through them orally. And then, as I said, he enabled Matthew to write the gospel of Matthew. That's the apostles' teaching. He enabled John to write the gospel of John. That's the apostles' teaching. He, be, he enabled John to write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That's the apostles' teaching. He enabled John to write Revelation. He enabled um, uh, not only Matthew and, and Luke, but he enabled uh, Peter to write 1st and 2nd Peter. That is the apostles' teaching. And then later, a man that wasn't even a believer yet who became an apostle, the apostle Paul, wrote 13 letters which are included in our New Testament. That is the apostles' teaching. The promise that Jesus made in the upper room came true. And they continued in the apostles' teaching. It began in Jerusalem, and it has continued until this very moment right here in this church. And we have it, the apostles' teaching. That's a gift that we have in the Bible. Now, I want to fast forward, forward you again. I'm going to take you to a Roman prison. I'm going to take you to a dungeon. This is the second imprisonment for the Apostle Paul. He picked up his pen, and he wrote to a young man who had been with him for quite some time. His name was Timothy. This was the last letter that Paul ever wrote. And this is what he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But it's for you, Timothy. Continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you. You know from childhood you have known what? The sacred scriptures. Now, to understand this, you see, you've got to go back to the first missionary journey. You've got to go back to where Paul and Barnabas came to this city called Lystra. And there in Lystra, Paul and Barnabas were preaching the gospel on that first journey but there was hostility and anger, and they stoned Paul and drug him out of the city. And they left him there as if he were dead. And later he got up, God healed him, and he went on to the next city, Derby. But as they were standing there, if you read it in the book of Acts, they were surrounded by some people who believed they're called disciples. And standing in that circle was an old lady named Lois but a younger woman named Eunice. And standing beside Eunice was her son, Timothy, who had become a disciple because of Paul's preaching in Lystra. Lystra was Timothy's hometown. And it was in that circle of disciples that these people stood. Timothy did not have a godly father. His father was a Greek. His father was a pagan. But he had a godly grandmother and a godly mother, Lois and Eunice. And so Paul is reflecting on that period, that time. He said, it's for you, but it's for you, Timothy. Continue in what you've learned. Firmly believe. You know that those who taught you, your, your wonderful, godly grandmother, your wonderful mother, Eunice, you know that from childhood you've known the sacred scriptures. What is the reference here? What is the sacred scriptures? The Old Testament, because that's all they had. But it was the sacred scriptures that was pointing to the Messiah that Paul was explaining and the reason he was stoned and left for dead. But God raised him up. Later, the apostle Paul came back 
to that city on the second journey, and Timothy joined him as a fellow companion. Now Paul is in prison. He knows he's going to die. And he's writing to this man, Timothy. He said it was the Scriptures that made you wise to salvation. But Timothy, I want to say something else. And he goes on to say, all Scripture. And there I think Paul is speaking prophetically. I don't think at that moment God even allowed him to know that the letter he's writing to Timothy would be a part of this revelation that we have today. But prophetically he is saying, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God, woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And we have it all. Amen? Now I want to fast forward you just a little further. Paul has been martyred for the cause of Christ. There was a man who picked up his pen. We don't know who he was. I personally think it may have been Apollos. Can't prove that. But he wrote the book of Hebrews, and this is what he says. And let us be concerned about one another. Hebrews chapter 10. In order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our worship meetings, as some habitually do, but here's what I want you to underscore in your mind, but encouraging each other. Now, why is that such an important phrase? Because that is the word that was used to define and name the Holy Spirit, the parakletos. The word parakletos was translated another encourager, another counselor, another teacher. I'm going to send you another parakletos. Here, the basic word parakletos is translated and related to you and to me to be encouragers, to do the work of the Holy Spirit. In other words, what he is saying is the Holy Spirit, the parakletos, came to give us the Word of God, to encourage us, to teach us, to reveal His will. But what this author is saying in Hebrews is, we are the parakletoi. That's the plural of parakletos. We are the parakletoi. We are the encouragers. We are the comforters. We are the teachers. Why? Because we have the gift that was given to us by the parakletos, the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, because of our relationship with God and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit now dwells within us, has given us the Word of God so that we can do the very work of the Holy Spirit in encouraging one another and building up one another and communicating the wonderful message to people so they can know the will of God. I don't know about you, but that just thrills me right down to the core. We are the parakletos, toy. We are the encouragers. The Word of God. The Word of God and the will of God. I want to leave you with a principle to live by. And it reads this way. Our basic criteria for discerning God's will must be grounded on God's truth. And what was the Holy Spirit called? The Spirit of Truth. Our basic criteria for discerning God's will must be grounded on God's truth as revealed by the Holy Spirit and recorded in Scripture. The Apostle Peter wrote in his second letter that no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation because no prophecy came by the will, the prophecy came by, by the will of man, not by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we have in the Word of God. I said earlier that 
I've been thinking a lot about the degree to which I appreciate this gift because it's so easy to take it for granted. But about 10 years ago, I was given a wonderful, wonderful privilege. came totally unexpectedly. I was passing the, my baton of leadership to my successor at the last church I pastored in Dallas. And I got a call from Broadman and Holman people in Nashville, and they had just finished a brand-new translation of the Bible called the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And I'd followed the story. I, I understood that translation. It's a wonderful translation. And their goal was to have the literalness of the King James and the friendliness of the NIV, for example. And I knew it was an accurate translation. And they said, Gene, would you be willing to do a Principles to Live by Study Bible from Genesis to Revelation? And somewhat naively, I said yes. I knew that my schedule was opening up, and they said, Jane, you can probably do this study in about two years. And I said, okay, hello. Seven years later, four days a week, literally my wife says five days a week, I ended up doing the Life Essentials Study Bible that includes 1,500 principles to live by from Genesis to Revelation. And men and women, you can't spend seven years, four days a week in the Word of God without coming to a deeper appreciation of the gift that God has given us. Thank God for the Bible. The Word of God, which gives us the will of God. Shall we pray? Father, what a privilege. What a gift. Not only the gift of the Bible, but more importantly, what the Bible points to, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Lord, to be our Savior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' wonderful name. And all the people said, Amen.